Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. And today I've got the honor of having uh, Sherry Kagi on the program. And Sherry is a Dove Award winning singer, songwriter, and a trailblazing worship artist. Uh, she has 10 albums, nine w- number one songs, three Dove Award nominations, and a Dove Award win. She returns with her first solo album in seven years. Exploring life's changing seasons, what I know to be true celebrates both the joy of marriage and becoming a grandparent, and also personal devastating sorrow. Now, this album is co-produced with legendary guitarist and Grammy award-winning recording artist Phil Kagi. The album is a stunning collection of folk and pop songs, exposing at times both unguarded emotion and an unshakable an unshakable profession of faith and the unchanging anchor of Christ. And I don't know about you, but in the year 2022, we need that unchanging anchor in Christ. But Sherry, thank you so much for being on the program. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so Sherry, we'll dive into the new album in, in just a little bit, but I always like to hear backstories. Mm-hmm. I like to hear the roads that got you where you are today. So as as a child growing up, what were some of your musical influences? What that that kind of prepared the palette for what you're doing today? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I think I liked listen listening to the radio like anyone else. We uh, we had a record player at home, and so we had albums and such as well. Uh, you know, I can remember. This is funny. This snapshot just comes up. Uh, my sister and I were born on the same day, exactly two years apart. I have an older sister. And so we had a lot of shared birthday parties when we were younger, similar friend group. Anyway, and I remember, you know how you traditionally might do pin the, pin the tail on the donkey as a party game? Well, I remember when uh, John Travolta was on the cover of that Saturday Night Fever album, you know, on that disco floor. And so we had uh, pinned the mustache on John Travolta <laughs> at our one of our little birthday parties. But so I remember having that that album with the Bee Gees and all of that stuff. And uh, Donna Summer, she works hard for the money. Uh, uh, you know, classical music. Um, and my dad played the accordion, and so there was some of that. Uh, trying to think of other. My very first Christian album was Amy Grant's. Age to age, and I at one time had you know one of her posters in my bedroom, on the closet wall. Um, trying to think of other early influences, uh, just kind of a, a a wide array like most people growing up, you know. So uh, learning, uh, listening to those um, music, <laughs> I'm assuming from the seventies. You're probably about my age. I, I was influenced by music as, as a kid in the 70s, and it sounds like a lot of the music that I listen to as well. <laughs> but when did you start playing? Uh, when did you start singing? When did that come about? Yeah, really, uh, the thing that I was, you know, every kid ha- sort of has their little thing that they're good at, whether it be sports or math or whatever. Uh, I'm horrible at math, but uh, the thing that I was good at was piano. <laughs> you know, I took a lot of piano lessons and kind of took to it and practiced a lot and did a lot of recitals, played for the talent shows at, at school and the offertories at church, all of that. Uh, so so piano was kind of the emphasis. I did enjoy singing, but it was never the priority until a little bit later uh, as I was at a church, you know, and uh, as a young married and began to eventually sort of help with the worship, uh, almost just uh, it naturally sort of flowed into that. So my first solo in church, I remember was, again, I mentioned Amy Grant, uh, we're both altos, you know, so I could sing her range. It was Amy Grant's Jehovah. Do you remember that song? I do. Uh, Jehovah, I love you so. Yeah. And so, but that was a, a time of discovery. To me, the singing was a means to deliver the song more so. And, uh, you know, there are people that can sing circles around me range wise, perhaps, or something. But uh, God was showing me that I could express my love for him, what I was learning in my Christian walk, my prayers, all of those things I could express through song. And and the singing was just you know the vehicle. <laughs> so so from there, what what was the road from there, Sherry, to becoming a professional musician? I, I know that you 
came on the scene, I guess, nationwide or worldwide in, in the early 90s. But what precipitated that? What brought you into the, uh, the, the Christian music, the professional career of, of being a musician? What brought you there? Yeah, well, we were, uh, my husband, my then husband at the time, we were a part of a small church in Southern California, Crossroads EV Free Church. Uh, and there is where I write, wrote a lot of my first worship songs that we sang corporately as a church. And uh, at that time as well, there was a woman in our parish who had a desire to start a, a weekly lunch program for the homeless in our area. And so we recorded uh, the first nine songs, say, that I'd written uh and on a little cassette tape, then somewhere in the process, I wrote a 10th song. And so we had 10 songs on a little cassette tape called Sherry Katie, Inside My Heart. And um, But we sold those tapes at the church, and we gave them that money. Those funds went into an account to purchase groceries for this weekly lunch program. Wow. So that was kind of where it started. And then from there, it really served as a demo. And my then-husband um, was involved uh, with some, uh, he was an audio engineer and so involved with mixing sound at certain Christian crusade events, evangelical events and such. And so uh, played the tape for some of the people in that community, eventually sent it on to a family friend, Peter York at Sparrow Records. And he, Peter used to play rhythm guitar with Phil Kagi on the road. So mm -hmm. that was the sort of the connection, the sort of in, if you will. But we had interest from these worship leaders, Marin uh, labels, worship, um, Maranatha Music, Vineyard Music. Remember, they would put out all these praise series for churches as a resource. And they wanted to s record all the songs. And uh, and 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 then uh, Peter heard the music at Sparrow. And then Charlie Peacock heard me performing. Um, and. They said, you know, don't don't sign anything yet. We 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 think we've got something here and we'd like you to come to Nashville. And that's the sort of the short way of saying then I signed that uh, deal in 1993 with Sparrow Records. So many of those first songs then went on the first few records. And I did actually then uh, work with Charlie Peacock as producer. And so it was a really um very affirming for me as a young, green, unsure, budding songwriter, you know, that it was, you know, I was enjoying listening to some of the artists on Sparrow at that time, loving Out of the Gray and Margaret Becker and some of these singer-songwriter types. And I didn't put myself in that camp, <laughs> but they um, they saw a, a home for me there. And uh, it was really a, a, a gift from the Lord. Well, just 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 from my end, you're you're certainly parallel in, in talent to any of those artists <laughs> that you just mentioned, in my opinion. Oh, um, you're kind. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you came on the scene. Was it 1994? Was the, was it the album called Child of the Father? Was that the title yes. album? Yes. Yes. And look, I happen to have it here. Put oh on wow! The cover, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Child of the Father. Yep. I, I have to ask um, someone that. I'm sure it was a long road to become, I guess, popular and 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 well known. But I, I'm always curious with musicians. What's it like hearing yourself on the radio for the first time? I can remember. I think probably everyone can remember where they were. We were in Southern California by then. I had two uh, children, uh, a son and a daughter, and I want to say that we were on our way home from some sort of Fourth of July. Uh, family get together event at our church and so we were in our van and that's when we heard it on the radio and that first single was open my heart and uh i re and so that was just yeah it was wow pretty neat and i remember also when the radio promoter was sparrow at that time kyle fenton was his name uh he called me at my house and uh said i've got some news for you and uh, he said, your single Open My Heart has gone number one on, on all three formats, which was, I guess, a big deal. The, wow. you know, AC, Inspo, and uh, CHR, Christian Hit Radio formats or whatever. And so that was just an exciting time for sure. <laughs> 
So, and I'm curious too, uh, thinking back to 1994 and the, and the music industry, just in your own view as a professional musician, how has the music industry changed from say the nineties until, you know, until now, has there, has there been a huge change? Yes. Oh my, my Lord. So there's been, you know, uh, some blessings and some curses, a friend of mine would call that in general, a blurse, <laughs> a, when, a combination of a blessing and a curse. So I don't know, just, I mean, there's been, there's just been the availability, the accessibility of artists' music by all these digital streaming platforms and such. So that's a blessing in some way, as far as, you know, people being able to get your music, but then it makes the job harder for the artist to earn a living that way uh, because people are just, you know, streaming stuff. And, and so it's, it's a catch 22. And so that's one, one change. Uh, and, you know, I had the experience of, of being, uh, ha having the aid of a major Christian record label to help launch me and introduce me and my music to the world. Um, but my last several recordings have been, you know, as an independent artist. And so I've experienced it both ways. The first, you have departments of people that are helping you with all the nuts and bolts of the thing. Um, and then uh, the second, you're wearing more of those hats and um, what I call the administration of ministry. <laughs> and um, so there, it's more challenging that way. And your heart as an artist, you know, longs to longs to sit in the music and share the music, but there's a lot of peripheral things that have to be tended to in order to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's just on my side as, as a non-musician, just as a listener and a, as a fan, um, I appreciate streaming. I appreciate MP3s. I, I appreciate the instantaneous listening that you, you can listen to any album that you want to, but I've got, my wife and I collect vinyls. And um, I've got a ton of vinyls behind me, and I, I miss that, Sherry. I miss I miss opening up the the vinyl record. I even miss the cassettes. You mentioned cassettes a few minutes ago, but I mentioned the cassette. I I, I miss the cassette when it comes out of its container, and you have to get a pencil and screw it back in. I miss that uh -huh. tactile feeling of the music. <laughs> you know, well, I yeah. appreciate that, and this was new for me with this album because I had always done and enjoyed taking care with the liner notes, uh, you know, including the lyrics inside of a package and maybe scripture verses or a little blurb about the song. Uh, but this time around, I decided to just sort of cut costs because this album has 15 songs on it. That was going to be a booklet of sorts, you know? And um, so I decided to just make the lyrics and stories available online at my website. So that was another switch that's sort of adapting to the times. And, uh, but now I just, I love that it's all there and people can still, still get that feeling of, I used to love to crack open a CD and listen to the whole thing and read all the lyrics as it, as it went by, you know, so I get it. <laughs> yeah. And, and absolutely. The thing I'd appreciate about your new album, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment as you've got 15 songs on it. So that's a, that's a lot of songs, and, and uh, that, that's because a lot of, uh, well, a lot of music that you listen to, uh, the artists don't don't put that much out. So I appreciate that, and we'll put provide the links below the video um, to how to look at the the liner notes and how to order the album as well. Uh, but let's talk about that, Sherry, if, if you would. What I know to be true. Again, this is your new album, and I, I can tell you some of my impressions. I listened to it about five times now, but. It, it reminds me of the the singer songwriters of the early to mid seventies. That's the feel oh, that I get, and cool. I grew up listening to that stuff, and I, I grew up loving that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I also notice on this album there are no it's not formulaic. There are no formulas. It seems on this album. Mm -hmm. Also, your voice is as beautiful and strong as it, as it's ever been on all of the other albums, uh, but this one is a little bit different. Uh, it comes across like you have lived these songs. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's crafted and formed by scars, and some of those scars haven't healed. And that's the impression that I get, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, but what were some of your thoughts coming into this album? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, it's always helpful to hear how someone else receives the music. Um, but, you know, it, it's been seven years since my last release. Uh, 2015, I released... Um, an album called No Longer My Own, 
Uh, before that, it was 2012, an album called So I Can Tell, which was um, really a lot of the healing songs um, after a painful divorce that I went through. Um, but so seven years, you know, what was I doing in that seven years? Well, I was living life, you know, I was still, um, on the road doing ministry events and, um, uh, but really the thing that got me propelled forward to record this newest batch was an event that happened in September, 2018. And that was the loss of my dad through suicide. So, you know, You say that and you exhale a minute because that's such a strange statement. Um, None of us as a family ever thought that that would be part of our story or that he would make that choice. I mean, he, you know, no question, he loved us all uh, fiercely. You know, I always knew I had the love and support of my dad um, with my musical endeavors, you know, with my life, anything, you know, Um, but I think he was despairing of some health challenges he was facing and he had always been very active. My father, very physically fit, a rock climber, a backpacker, you know, a retired deputy sheriff, uh, a Marine veteran, all, all of these things. And that was, I think, challenging for him. Uh, we don't know all where his headspace was, but that rocked my world in a big way. And I really plunged into a deep, deep sea of grief and, you know, the scriptures speak of griefs of various kinds. I believe it's in, in Romans, maybe. Um, and I've experienced grief before, and I have um, learned how to bring that to the Lord. The scripture says he's near to the brokenhearted. And I've, you know, uh, known his comfort. But this was um, a different type of grief. And, and I would say that I was in a fog of grief. And uh, I felt like my mojo for life had been affected. I was still very much pressing into the Lord, you know, immersing myself in his word, clinging here for dear dear life, believing that somehow he could heal my heart, um, you know, trusting in his word, but unable to just slap a scripture on it and go, okay, okay, this is good. I'm good. You know, I had to, uh, in, in that wilderness time, uh, really trust that he was holding me. Uh, and I didn't know would I record again. I was processing my grief through songwriting, as is my way. And that was therapeutic, very helpful. And you hear a lot of that on this record. Um, and I go to the, you know, there's a song on there about suicide. Um, and it's it's just, it will tear your heart out, you know. But it's where I was. And God was right there in the midst. Um, so, uh, but to, to get to circle back to your question, it, it took some time to get through some of that grief. I ended up also seeking some grief counseling with a Christian counselor, and she helped me even further, uh, leading me to eventually write a letter to my dad. Um, when a suicide happens, uh, it's even though our relationship was good, uh, there's some, the suddenness of, of it leaves things emotionally incomplete. And uh, so it was, um, surprised me how much it helped me to be able to say these things to my dad and have her stand in his place, so to speak, as I read this letter and essentially was saying, you know, all the things I wanted to say and also saying goodbye, um, you know, which was really, um, a hard moment, but, um, also it's just framed around the beautiful truth and promise that, um, though we were father and daughter, we are also brother and sister in Christ. Um, my dad was a very, um, genuine believer and, um, we could speak about the things of the faith and the scriptures. And, um, and so we have, you know, that hope we have uh, that, that all it's a temporary goodbye <laughs> that I'll see dad again. But doing this record, um, uh, it was kind of like, okay, I had the songs. I was still feeling broken, like, you know, just like like a bird with a flapping wing or something. Uh, And yet God wasn't letting me off the hook with these songs. And it was sweet to connect with Uncle Phil, Phil Peggy, who we produced together, as you've mentioned. And he said, you know, he, he understood the space that I was in. 
And he said, you know, we can we can do this slowly over time. We can draw this over a few months' time. Traditionally, in the past, I would approach records, you know, uh, you get all the musicians together, you record five or six songs a day and try to get your 10, 12 song album. And then you go in and you do the over, overdubs and the bells and whistles and the vocals and such. But you're it, it's a little more intense and a faster pace. And I, I could say if, if there's been any residual effect of this event in my life, it would be the pace at which I can approach things. <laughs> And so it was such a gift to me that Phil was willing to um, work with that pace. And uh, it was really a sweet gift. Yeah. Well, uh, your honesty in this album and, and, the, and the, the genuine reality that, that you're a human being comes out in this. Mm. And, and I certainly appreciate that. Mm. Uh, so, Sherry, if it's OK with you, we'll, we'll kind of scan through these songs on the album. And the first one that, that really stands out is, is number one song on the album is Yours to Keep. And you state this is the first official co-write with, with your uncle, Phil Kagey. Mm -hmm. Now, from a non-musician standpoint, can you help me understand what, what does an official co-write mean? Well, it means we were in the room together working on the song. You know, I most often have written by myself at the piano. You know, that's where I pour my heart out to the Lord. Um but there's been an occasion where I've done some co-writing and I'm always better for it because it's always a different song than it would have been had it been just myself. And I, I think in that track, you can hear Phil's influence. But uh, I, I went to his house uh, one day and we actually wrote this song back in 2014. Um, so it was before this had happened. And uh so I didn't even, I wasn't even sitting at a keyboard. I mean, he had his guitar in hand. I kind of had a little bit of a lyrical thought and I had been at a church service where we were asked to reach our hands forward. Like we were giving our burdens over to the Lord. And it was kind of a meaningful thing, you know, to just visually, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm giving this over to you. And so, um, that was kind of the, my headspace as we got together and we just began to hash out lyric, uh, lyric and, Melody, he on his on the guitar, and um, I love where we landed on that one. It's it's a pretty amazing song. A couple of a couple of the the lines that really stick out to me is, and uh, I may not have these exact, but it's take my love, take my healing, trust my words, and not your feelings. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what what did you mean by that? What, what, can you give me a, a, a what do, what do those words mean to you? Yeah, I mean, aren't we as human creatures so? so controlled at times and swayed by our feelings, the feeling of the moment. And um, God's word is just, just, you know, held out there for us. And we can, um, we can sort of train and renew our mind and we can, we can jerk whatever, whatever emotion we're feeling. We can, we can um, discipline ourselves to just come back to the word as our center and go, okay, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm worried about the future. I'm whatever, but you say you have, a, you a, will give me a hope in the future. You know, you can sort of redirect your thinking and claim truth instead of all of that emotion. And that's not to say that our emotions are, are bad in any way, right? He made us that way to feel the joy and the sorrow and everything in between the gladness and the guilt and the shame and it's all in there, you know. Um, but he's like, bring all of those things to me and let my word inform those things for you, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trust in his word instead of our feelings, it can lead us astray at many times. And yep, I think we're yep. all guilty of that. So for sure. <laughs> the next song is It Hurts to Say Goodbye to You. And uh some lyrics that stuck out to me in, in the song is certainly precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And this other one, this, this this other line really hit me hard. Who will read the scriptures to remind me what I know to be true? Can mm -hmm. you speak of some of those things? Yeah, so that, uh, the verse in uh, Psalm 116, 15 that you quoted, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I worked that in the song because when my sister called me with the news about dad, uh, she called me from California, me in Tennessee, uh, that night, as I was just reeling with this reality or trying to even grapple with it, that verse came to mind. 
you know, I didn't have the wherewithal to, to open my Bible and look for something. It was just something that the Holy Spirit, I think, spoke to my heart. And it was a mystery to me. You know, how is it that this, you know, me losing my dad in, in this way, in this awful way, uh, that, that, that somehow the Lord would be pleased to receive him, you know, because it precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So, um, but then the other thing you mentioned, really, if you listen to the song again, basically I was planning dad's celebration of life service, you know, and we were thinking of the elements we would want to include the scriptures, what music I'm asking mom, what are your favorite hymns? Did, you know, is there some, what's musically, what do we want to do? My sister and I scanned photos from literally 88 photo albums um, because dad was a world traveler and an adventurer and all of that. And so it was family and then his world travel, all this put to music. So, you know, who, who will share the, the memories, um, and who will read the scriptures, you know, my sister or her husband, my husband, you know, what are the scriptures we're going to have read? Because right now I need to be reminded of what I know to be true. And I, um, and that is that my hope my anchor is in the Lord Jesus and my dad's was as well. And I'll see him again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're like me, I need to be reminded daily because a lot of other things in the world remind me of other things. So (laughs) it's it's good for me to get back to the scripture. So what truth that you're presenting in that song. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, The next song is, is restoration song. And I love the piano opening here. Uh, Is that you? Yes, yes. Uh, we built the songs that way, um, uh, with the exception of, say, maybe Yours to Keep was a little more guitar-oriented. Um, but we started where I would just play the piano vocals, and then we build it from there. And um, this was a sweet song that um, my husband and I, my after divorce, the Lord saw fit to bring me a new husband. And um, I will say just this is important for any of your listeners who are single, that in those single years... Um, the Lord was my good husband. You know, he was my heavenly husband and he, uh, he was Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provided, you know, I, I grew in my intimacy with the Lord in the absence of an earth husband. And, um, so when the Lord brought another earth husband, it was, um, like the icing on the cake I was already eating, if you will <laughs> put it that way. And so this was a song that, um, we wrote, oh, I, I had kind of the, the, the gist of the song, a couple verses in the chorus the, and such. But then my husband sat with me and um, we weren't married then yet. He sat with me and we hashed out some of the lyrics in the additional verses and stuff together. So he contributed with that. And then we just, you know, he's not a singer by any stretch. He's a carpenter, you know, <laughs> cool. and um, as was Jesus, right? And I like to say that I've loved a carpenter with a capital C, and now I love one with a little C. Um, but uh, we sang it together at our wedding. And so it was very meaningful, you know, that that um, God is one who um, just when you think you could never love again or, you know, whatever your story is, those have been touched by divorce, um, that God can uh, do a work in your heart in such a way that open you up to love again and um and, and write a new story. You know, he's, he's one who b- redeems those broken things in our lives. And he's the God of, of second chances, you know, <laughs> second and third and fourth and fifth and, and yeah. so on and so on. Thankfully, yeah. thank God that he is mm-hmm. uh, Sherry. The next song is coming down and I love the string section on this. Can you, who were, who were the, the uh, guys and gals behind the strings here? Yes. Um, oh, well, Stu Duncan, played uh, the fiddle on this song and uh, Matt Nelson played cello. And then, it, you know, was the piano. It's a fairly, you know, it's the, the instrumentation is fairly um, simple uh, and it has, doesn't it kind of an Appalachian feel. I wrote this song, yeah. actually some friends of mine have um, a beautiful property and cabin in uh, the kind of Franklin, Tennessee area. And, I was able to go early on in my grief process, go to their cabin just by myself in hopes of just processing with the Lord and maybe some songwriting fruit and that kind of thing. And this song coming down was one that I wrote that weekend. Um, and it's, vi- it's visual, right, in the lyric. 
Um, but it's kind of like, you know, gosh, Lord, I had, um, you know, I'd had the joy of being married again after such a painful divorce years prior. And, and now dad, this has happened with dad. And now I, you know, I, I'm coming down to the valley again with you, Lord. And I, I don't know, this is an unshorted type of territory. Um, but all I can cling to is your grace that I know and trust will be sufficient. And um, because there was no quick fix, you know, I was wanting to try to control the grief process so that I could get about being useful to, in the kingdom. You know, I could get about my assignment, uh, but sure. there was no rushing this process. And the Lord um, showed me that weekend that, um, you know, his grace was going to be enough for me. Uh, I could rest in that. I didn't have to know how long I would be in this valley, um, but he would once again bring me, you know, he'd bring me back to an ascension kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Jerry, the next song is destination home and some, some lines that stuck out to me were just passing through in a foreign land and our hearts were made for somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that song. Yeah. Um, well, I remember maybe a day or two after I learned of dad's passing, uh, kind of the sentiment, what I found myself thinking was, dad, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. And I wrote it in my journal. And uh, that was the opening line to the song. You didn't have to do that to go and take your life. Um, I shouldn't have had to take that phone call in the night. And um, so it's me just, you know, telling, telling what happened in a sense. There was also the moment that I realized that, you know, while dad loved us fiercely, there wasn't, he didn't leave me a note, you know, a written note. Uh, he really didn't leave even mom a note other than some uh, heartfelt lyrics that were from the Elvis Presley song, I Can't Help Falling in Love With You. He wrote that in his own hand and placed it, um, you know, where she would find it. Um, so it was a gesture of love to her, at least. And I was glad for that. Um, but you know, had just that, that moment. So, you know, a, a little bit of anger that I had to process through and I didn't really live there, but it, I had to move through that and uh, go, gosh, you, you left the lyric is you left a note for mother, but there was none for me. If I didn't know how much you cared, guess I'd still be angry. The power of a moment. You just can't take it back. Lord have mercy for the things we lack, you know? And then we're just passing through. I mean, this is a broken world, but we're, you know, we're passing through this foreign land and we're really heading on to our great destination in heaven. And I did have a phone conversation with dad. This is before I knew any of this would happen as he was realizing, gosh, he might not be able to travel to the extent that he had before. I said, dad, it, it could be that your next great destination is heaven, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> And so, you know, we kind of had like a little celebration on the phone about the reality of that, the hope of that for the believer. Well, uh, throughout all of these songs, it, it's it's really uh, conveying truth to the listener. Um, but it, in addition to that, it, you've got some great musicianship on this as well. And you spoke about, you know, certainly Phil Kagey, you know, you, you can't get any better than that. But, <laughs> Can you talk about some of the other musicians that helped you frame this uh, new album? Sure. Um, yeah, Phil Keggy, just fantastically gifted and so generous with his time and talent. Um, Steve Brewster on drums and percussion. I've, he's played on my other projects. Just so gracious, um, talented. Uh, so we, we recorded most of this in Phil's home studio, but then we went um, to Steve's home studio. He's got this really impressive uh, set up there. And then as well, we recorded at Blair Masters um, home studio. So um, we kind of made some rounds. Now, so Blair, even though I played the majority of the keys, Blair uh, has played on previous projects of mine as well. And just does a great job with say, you know, um, some, you know, ethereal pads, you know, synth pads or, you know, um, a, an accordion or, just kind of the bells and whistles, the, the, the little more of the ear candy that you hear. Um, trying to think of who else. Dave Cleveland 
uh, graciously played a couple of guitar solos for us. Um, uh, and, and Phil did the lion's share of the bass and the guitar. Um, and uh, we already mentioned the cello and the fiddle and all that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and then some great vocalists as well. Uh, Kim Keys and Gene Miller um, joined us for some of the BGVs. And then I did, you know, some of the harmony lines. Phil did a little bit. So, yeah. Rex Paul well, Schnell uh, helped, um, helped uh, with the mixing aspect of it. And just great, great talented folks. <laughs> Well, it's obvious that the musicians are, are top rate and the, the production is, is as well. So, you Thank know, you. and I, I've listened, listened to music for many, many years now, and I can, I can tell high quality music. And this is something uh, that's obviously with your album. And, and I certainly enjoyed and will enjoy listening to it as well. And I'm telling other folks about it. So it's, it's a great album, Sherry. Thank you. Um, the next song I'd like to talk about is Abandonment Wound. Um, a couple of lines that stuck out to me. And I'll, I'll get over it when I'm over it. Time is no healer of wounds like most people assume it is. And what honesty coming from a, a believer, a professing Christian, mm -hmm. that many times I think we're, we're looked at, we, we, we're supposed to have it all together. And mm -hmm. it's just a Bible verse here and there will heal us totally. And we don't need time to heal those wounds. But, mm -hmm. but thank you for that honesty. What, what would you say about Abandonment Wound, the song that you made? Yeah, um... Well, you know, I knew, I hadn't framed my dad's uh, passing as an abandonment wound. I mean, you know, I hadn't until I was preparing for a conference. I would be doing some worship, and we were in Psalm 16, I think was the text of their theme. And I was reading kind of the whole thing. But there was a verse in there that said, he will not abandon us from the grave. And when I read that, I just burst into tears, um, just, you know, alone by myself. And I think the Lord was showing me that, in a sense, I did have a sort of abandonment wound with that, with Dad's departure, and um, and so that's really where the you know the inspiration of the song comes. But also, just what you said. I mean, I have you know when you've been on platform ministry and you've you've touted you know here's here's these scriptures, here's here's the way to live. You know, there's a you know sort of. I don't know, uh, maybe there's a little bit too much self-confidence in that. And here was a situation where, again, I couldn't control my grief journey. And so it was like, I was worried, would, will I, would I be a, um, would my testimony weaken at all that I wasn't getting my act together, you know, fast enough? Well, I'll get over it when I'm over it, you know, <laughs> because it was taking me longer than I had hoped. I remember even saying in, in the grief share meeting, you know, expressing that, you know, um, and there was just all manner of grace for it, you know. And so I think it. on the other end, I have an empathy for people uh, who who can't just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And and it's it's no indication of um a weakness in God or, or, or anything. It's, um, to me, I was proclaiming, okay, I'm believing that, you know, God is faithful. He's going to uh, see me through this, but I'm going to, um, I, I'm going to have to let go of the reins a little bit on, on the how and when of it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the new Testament talks about, uh, we're, we're basically jars of clay and when you drop, drop a jar of clay, it cracks. And, and uh, mm -hmm. we're all kind of cracked pots, I, I think. And <laughs> when you put it in a dark room, you put a cracked pot on the floor and you put a candle inside. Well, that light shines out of a lot of cracks. And I think that God can use our scars yes. in, in ways that we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. And the more cracks and scars we have sometimes, I think the, the more God can use us in what he wants to, sure. to accomplish. For sure. Yeah, yeah and, and that song... Um, you know, I, when I brought it to Phil, in my mind, it wasn't totally complete. Um, and, and, and what we ended up doing is I had, you know, I've just, I'm an avid journaler. So in this process of seeking the Lord for healing, I was journaling um, lots of scripture verses and things. So we ended up, I just read the scripture in as a, as a, as a bridge of sort, a musical bridge. And it, that was so powerful. That was the first time I think I had done that on a recording and uh, I was in the vocal booth with Phil, and as I was reading these, I mean, you can hear the emotion in my voice. I got a little choked up um, because just God's yeah. word is um, 
so powerful, you know, and I was moved in that. And we decided, let's just leave it, you know, let's not, you know, try to get another take and polish it. You know, let's just leave that because this is really real, you know. <laughs> well, well, thank you for leaving that in and, and not editing it out. I'm sure there was a temptation <laughs> to do that, but it comes across mm-hmm. to the listeners being real, honest mm-hmm. and open. And, and I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, Sherry, the next uh, song is False Anchor. And tell me a little bit about this song. Sure. Uh, I had been to a Christian kind of spiritual renewal retreat where the theme was Hebrews 619. Uh, we uh, have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And we talked about what are the false anchors in our lives that we cling to for security or comfort, you know, uh, other than Christ. And that's kind of where the song uh, comes from. And interestingly, I wrote this song uh, before dad had passed. And, and, and the lyric is, you know, it, it can't be my father. It can't be my mother. It can't be my husband or my son. Meaning, you know, I can't put all my security and hope in, in an individual or a house or a retirement plan or a car. You know, at the time we had, we were juggling with one car. Um, it can't be my car. It'll only go so far, you know, whatever. And it's just, you know, nope, nope, none of those things. Uh, I, I've got to put my hope in the anchor of Christ. <laughs> And there's a line in that song, you're heavy when you sink. I, I like that line. <laughs> right, the anchor, right. If we if we yeah. put our, if we hold to other things and those things uh, disintegrate or they are no longer there or those things disappoint or betray or whatever, um, then what, what do we have, you know? So um, it just all comes back to clinging to Jesus and, and you know, s- setting our anchor with him. Um, he's our true security. <laughs> And uh, the next song is Fear. I think this is my favorite song on the entire album. Uh, mm-hmm. Tomorrow it may be different, but this, this song really sticks with me. It's different. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's so different, and I haven't heard so, a song like this in a long time. Mm-hmm. And I th- it, the, the song changes, I, I'm guessing. Is that a chord change within the song that it, 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 it's really that you can feel tension or something in the song when, right. when, when I'm listening to it? Tell me about this song, Fear. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think that the tension that you hear musically, you know, rightly marries the con- the lyrical content, you know, how fear can overtake us. And I've certainly battled with that in my own life um, where, you know, it goes back to that being ruled by our feelings and our emotions. We can just get caught in all the fear of these unknowns and things that may never even happen. And yet we're almost paralyzed at times with that. And um so much of our battle as believers, I think, is, um, you know, choosing faith over fear, you know, and it is and it's a constant back and forth, back and forth. Well, am I going to am I going to believe God is who he says he is and he's going to do what he says he will do? Um, or am I going to believe the lies sometimes of the enemy that want to keep us stuck over here in a fearful place? But, you know, the song breaks into um, you know, that new section that talks about uh, God's perfect love, it's perfect love that casts out fear. So Lord, you know, just flood me with your perfect love be- and, and flush this fear out of me. Uh, let me, you know, rest in you again. Yeah, very. Mm-hmm. It's an excellent song. I, I, I certainly love this song. Um, mm-hmm. and the next song, Sherry, is Take My Little and Make It Much. And listening to this song, I, I, it's like an upbeat and I get a Motown feel. In this yeah. song, but I, I could be wrong. But tell me about this song. Uh, well, yeah, Phil says it's sort of a Carol King vibe. You mentioned some of the singer songwriters of the '70s or whatever. Yeah, Motown, Carol King. When um, when I heard the guitar solo um, on this track, I mean, right away it took me to the Jackson Five. I mean, my sister and I oh, wow. had a little what is it, the '45s? Those little albums, a little record yeah. player with the '45s, and we had one that had like you know A B C. As easy as sure. one, two, three. And um, so somehow my mind, I went back to the Jackson 5, but this is just a fun sort of playful scripture song, right? It's like a vacation Bible school song, Sunday school song uh, about, you know, how the Lord multiplies our meager offerings. Take my little, make it much. And I think I, um, you know, approaching this record, it was very much a step of uh, faith uh, and dependency on God because uh, it was a, a real struggle for me to even move forward, you know, <laughs> like leading with a limp. And, um, and so it was like, Lord, take this, you know, take this offering and use it for your good in the kingdom and in the, in the world. And I, um, I feel 
I feel very, um, very unsure. I feel, you know, this is a battle, but I'm, I'm choosing to believe that you're bigger than this and you're going to take this thing and, and use it. And you're going to take this story and redeem it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good words. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what babies bring is the next song. Tell, tell us a little bit about this song. Sir. Uh, well, I had songs, you know, of yesteryear back when my children were little, um, a song for my son, little boy on his knees and, a song for my daughter, beautiful little girl. Well, now um, that daughter is married with two little boys, but I wrote wow. this song when she was expecting her first. And I uh, surprised her with it at her a baby shower and played it uh, for her and all the women that were present. And uh, the lyrics are, you know, just they're um, printed in a, sh framed in a shadow box and hung on the wall <laughs> in Oliver's bedroom. Um, our grandson that's now four, and, uh, you know, the legacy continues, you know, it's a high and holy calling to be a mother, to be a parent. And it's been a joy to watch my daughter step into that role and also just a, a huge blessing uh, to us to uh, to know that we can have influence uh, for good on our grandchildren. We can love on them and, and pray for them and build relationship with them and, you know, create safety for them. And so, yeah, so that's what babies bring. Brace yourself for the joy of a glorious boy. It was fun uh, writing the, the lyrics for that. Amazing song. The next song is So Much More. This is another upbeat song. Tell us about So Much More. Um, this comes actually from a devotional. I want to say probably many of your listeners are, familiar with streams in the desert, the streams in the desert devotional. There's one called Springs in the Valley. <clears throat> and I had written, um, this, there was a two stanza poem from that devotional that I'd written in my journal. And when, when it came time to do that, the slideshow that I described at my dad's celebration of life, we had all these pictures and songs. And then at the very end, the last slide was the lyrics to this poem and it was just rolling up the screen. That was the final sentiment, you know. And I later fashioned it into a song, added another verse, uh, you know, a channel section, and, you know, kind of shaped it into a song that we could um, include. And I played it actually at a quicker tempo to Phil <coughs> on the piano. And, uh, but he heard it a little, little more pulled back, a little slower. And we, um, he played the ukulele on it. So it kind of has a Caribbean or islandy feel. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it definitely is like one of these things. It's not like the other. It, it sort of has its own niche on the record. But I love just the the hope in it um, that there's so much more beyond this life. And it, just when we feel like we've experienced and tasted this much of God's goodness and his love for us, there's so much more that's beyond us, you know, and even um, framing it um, with, with heaven in mind, you know, that now we know in part, but then we will know in full. And that's, that's what my dad is experiencing right now. You know, <laughs> yeah. when, when faith becomes sight, uh, Sherry, the next song is some hearts don't mend. I'm sorry. Some hearts don't mend. And you've got a line in this about good grief and, mm. and, uh, I'll never think of the term good grief in the same way. Uh, <laughs> And, and I think the line goes, there's such a thing as good grief that honors the weight of the memory when it's done. Some hearts don't mend on this side of heaven. There's another line in that that says yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But the, the term good grief, um, mm -hmm. you know, we've all used that term, but mm -hmm. you, you phrased it in a different way. Tell us about some hearts don't mend. Yeah, well, um, even if we, as we have some measure of healing over time with whatever it is that we're grieving, whatever loss it is, um, Grief has a funny way of just sort of popping up again and um, <clears throat> taking you by surprise, you know. And so it's not to say that God doesn't have the power to heal, but there is um, <clears throat> what, what we know that there's going to be a total and a complete healing that we experience only in heaven. And so <clears throat> it's, we just experience a measure of it now of release and freedom and deliverance that, you know, he can bring. So um, and yet. I think that where I, where I frame it in, as good grief is that, you know, the, the extent at which we grieve a relationship, you know, uh, is 
also speaks to the value that you placed in that relationship, you know, how important it was to you, how invested you were in it, et cetera. So um, it's kind of like you're honoring, you know, you're honoring the memories that you had um, when you grieve, you know, um, you're saying this, this mattered to me in, in losing you or losing this, whatever it may be, um, is, is really, really hard. And I'm never really going to be the same, honestly. Um, I'm going to cling to Jesus in it, but this, this really, um, has transformed me, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, great song. The next song is Hold On to Harvest. And I was listening to this kind of had a, to me, kind of a fairy tale feel. Uh, um, and I love the piano on this as well. Uh-huh. Tell me about Hold On to Harvest. <clears throat> sure. Um, well, this song was inspired also by another devotional, I think, um, possibly from the streams in the desert. Um, so I, you know, borrowed little phrases and concepts. <clears throat> And fashioned a song around it. Um, and, you know, I, I initially, I my working title for the song was The Pruning Song. <laughs> and it was only then when I brought it to Phil, you know, that we began to think about, okay, well, what, what are we really going to call this song? Is it really the, the pruning song? Um, and then, no, we agreed that we should call it Hold On Till Harvest. Um, and, you know, there's so much beautiful analogy in scripture about you know, how he's the vine, we are the branches and how we're to abide in him. And, um, and, and sometimes he can bring the most beauty, um, through painful prunings, um, you know, but he's like a big picture of God. So he's, he's chipping away at, at the flesh stuff in us and, um, to make, you know, that we would produce more fruit, you know, and I, and then sometimes I can just go, okay, God, I've had enough pruning. I'm good. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm good, but <clears throat> it's an, and it's a process, you know, but he's so gracious to, um, I, I remember reading years ago, I want to say it was Bruce Wilkerson's like the secrets of the vine or something like that. I want to say, and I, I think it might've been him who talked about, you know, studying, vine dressers and how they carefully lift up the vine, um, suspend it from, so that it, it's not trampled upon on the ground. And it's, it's the care that the vine dresser takes with his vineyard. And so the, it's a picture of how, what, how the Lord treats us. You know, he's, um, he's not, uh, he's not looking to hurt us. He's looking to, to remove things that are hurtful to us, you know, and to um, grow us into a stronger, healthier branch. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So final final song on this album, and I, I think this is number 15. And, and thank you for going through all of these songs. Sure. Uh, that, that's that's amazing. But the last song on the album is Hope is Believing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this track was featured in the movie Christmas Ranch. Uh, tell me about the song. Yes. Um, yeah, that was a neat little challenge, the director of this movie. Um, a few years back had approached me and asked, would I consider writing an original song for the movie? And so I asked to to read the script and he, uh, told me kind of, you know, what scenes to hone in on. And, um, in the movie, the horse is called hope. And, um, it's just anyway, without giving the whole plot of the movie, the song was, um, uh, you know, written to go along with the story. And, uh, I love the, you know, the treatment on the song. Uh, this was one we had recorded prior to, and um, Bill Deaton, uh, I, I played the piano on this, and Blair Masters did kind of some string and, you know, cymbal embellishment, that kind of thing. Um, but Bill Deaton recorded and uh, produced this one for us. And it was sweet because I had never put it on an album. It was in the movie. Um, it was sweet to be able to include it as a bonus track, you know? Yeah, well, very good song. Now, Sherry, are there any plans in the future to tour with this album? Um, you know, I've got, uh, you know, some invitations for fa- in th- this fall. I really haven't been on the road in this initial uh, period here of late. Just uh, <clears throat> been focusing on, you know, my very laser focus has been to uh, steward these songs and get them released as God required, right? And then trust him with what opens up after that. And so I do have some invitations for ministry this fall and 
I don't know that this a traditional tour, you know, like not heading on a bus for 30 dates kind of thing. Um, but as those opportunities go, I'll just kind of step, step into them. And, um, you know, it's a, that's where a lot of ministry really happens. And so it's really a privilege to go and do that. The world has changed a little bit for traveling artists and, uh, you know, artists that, you know, you saw during COVID artists doing concerts in their living room and, in you know, yeah. doing a Facebook live and, and th these different tools that we, we have. So, um, it's a different kind of world. And yet when you, when there's a calling on your life, you figure out, you know, how to, how to do it, you know, how to share what God has put on your heart. And, and when he's brought you through something, you're just compelled to share it. Yeah. And Sherry, if someone wants to order this new album, what I know to be true, how would they do that? Yes. Um, you can get it on all the digital and streaming platforms um, and through my website. Now we have, you can actually, I did an old school, like the actual physical CD. Not everybody even has a CD player anymore, but um, I'm sort of old school that way. So if you want the physical CD, that's there. I can sign it and send it, but also you can download the songs individually or the whole album, that kind of thing. And I'm on social media, you know, so um, you can catch up with me there. <laughs> Yeah, and I encourage you to order this album. It is a tremendous um, album, and it really touches the heart. And plus the mm -hmm. great musicians on it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll put the links below the video. Uh, if someone wants to order the album, they just click on the link. It will take it take them to your website, and they could certainly order it there. Mm -hmm. Now, Sherry, I want to ask you a, a left-field question here. When you get into your car or SUV, whatever you're driving, what's on your playlist? What, what, kind of, what, what music are you listening to currently? Oh gosh, that's, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, I naturally gravitate towards the singer songwriter, you know, kind of musicians. Um, but honestly, anymore, I talk, I, I listen more to talk radio, it seems, um, you know, or I'm using drive time to, you know, uh, to, to uh, do a phone call or something. Um, so it's really hard for me to, to even answer like who I'm currently listening to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I totally understand. Another question, and this will be the last left field question here. If you could perform with anyone, uh, dead or alive, uh, from the past uh, that you haven't before or with before, <laughs> who would it be? Famous musician? Uh, could you pick some some musicians out that you would love to perform with or write with or play with? Hmm. That's good. Well, you know, Brian, I've already, you know, had the occasion of... Um, playing with so many talented folks. Um, huh, who would I want to play with? You know, uh, interestingly, I always just loved Fernando Ortega's voice. Um, and he's a piano player also. Um, we did a, my very first Friday night sing at, at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago was me and Fernando Ortega, but we didn't actually sing together. I had my set, he had his set, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so that's one that comes to mind. You know, another um, Christian artist that I really appreciate and love is Sarah Groves. Uh, mm -hmm. Her thoughtfulness as a songwriter, so gifted, and um, her honesty in songwriting. So there's a couple. Yeah, yeah. Good, good selections. Well, mm -hmm. Sherry, um, thank you for coming on the program and talking about your new album, What I Know mm -hmm. to Be True. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a joy. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to add? Oh, gosh. Well, I thank you for allowing me to come um, on Vine Life, right? Uh, and we talked about the yeah. Vine, so that's good. Uh, but I want to add um, upward and onward, I guess, you know, upward and onward. <laughs> Well, a tremendous new album. I encourage those listening, go ahead and order this album and mm -hmm. give it a listen and be blessed by it. But Sherry, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you, Tony. And until next time.